Um, it is my honor to introduce our speakers for the first session of the afternoon, Dr. Laron P. Brooks and Mr. Dawu Bey. Dr. Laron B. Brooks is the curator of the African American Art History Initiative at the Getty Research Institute and the curator of African American collections and acquisitions at the Getty Research Institute. In this capacity, Dr. Brooks is also the curator and co-curator of several archives, including those of the Johnson Publishing Company, architect Paul Revere Williams, sculptor Richard Hunt, and Dr. Robert Ferris Thompson, among others. Dawa Bey is an artist, photographer, and educator celebrated for his rich, psychologically compelling portraits. Renowned for his early street photography and deeply probing portraits, the two, and uh, the two seven, 2017 MacArthur Fellows recent bodies of landscape work focus on the construction of history and memory. And perhaps stating the obvious, today's symposium was inspired by the exhibition Dawood Bay Elegy, which I hope we've, um, everybody in this room has seen, and if you haven't, Please see it and see it again and again. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Brooks and Mr. Bay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending the, this conversation. Thank you, Daoud, for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valerie, and thank you, everyone here at the museum, for creating the space and uh, really uh, making this. This is a really special occasion to celebrate Daoud's work, but also the ideas uh, behind that work. And here we have the artist himself that we can engage with, we can learn from, and we can uh, really get a sense of where this really important historical work comes from. So thank you, everyone. So Daoud, you've been working, making work, you know, for, for a while now. You know, and in terms of the lineage, uh, the, the artistic lineage, right, that you come from, uh, would you want to speak about that lineage, who your influences in terms of how you make work? Well, well first of all, uh, thank everyone again. Uh, I think my lineage, very broadly speaking, I can go from very broad to very specific because I consider the work that I do to be part of the ongoing history of black expressive culture. Mm -hmm. That's the broad frame. Yeah. And within that, uh, the pieces of that expressive culture that I respond to are extremely diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say my conversation as an artist begins essentially with two artists in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, the first, an overarching one, being John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. Coltrane is my model both of artistic rigor, artistic intentionality, uh, and the sense that the work we do exists both on this plane and on another plane as well. Uh, my introduction to his music as a teenager, when I was a musician, a drummer, uh, was profound. And I think uh, the initial experience of John Coltrane uh, and his rigor in terms of redefining the language of improvisation and music that we call jazz through his exceeding mastery of his instrument and form and idiom uh, gave me a pretty high aspirational mm -hmm. place to look to. And then secondly, because uh, the place after music where I decided I was going to practice was uh, photography. And in that space, the initial uh, and continuing uh, inspiration that spoke to me was Roy D. Carava. Mm -hmm. Because Roy D. Carava 
Would the Caraba was at that time certainly uh, the only African-American uh, photographer who was using the medium not merely as a documentary tool mm -hmm. or as a tool for photojournalism, but he was using it as a highly subjective mm -hmm. tool to his own form of subjective expression. And certainly Roy D. Carraba's uh, intentionality around the fact that he could wrap this ambitious material and conceptual agenda and ambition around the black subject. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the photographs in Night Coming Tenderly Black mm -hmm. in all likelihood would not exist, certainly in the form that they do without Roy D. Carraba. That work is, the, is a direct conversation with the Caraba. Anchored also on the literary side in that case by Langston Hughes, whose work that I encountered very early on mm -hmm. in my, uh, I wouldn't even call it creative development, personal development mm -hmm. as a young African American. You know, so for that work, the Caraba materially. Mm -hmm. The fact that the photographic medium was not just a transcriptive mm -hmm. medium, yeah. Yeah. but that it was actually a field that was ripe for very deep material manipulation in the service of making work about and of a particular culture. Yeah. And then adding, you know, Langston Hughes' literary trope uh, to that, to uh, the title from that couplet, Night Coming Tenderly, Black Like Me. Mm -hmm. I got the profound couplet, Night Coming Tenderly. Tenderly. Like night's supposed to make you nervous, right? <laughs> you're scared in the it's dark. It's sneaking up on you. But it's tender, okay. like yeah. me. Yeah. Coming tenderly, black like me. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I, I could go on you know, to Toni Morrison, who is equally as impactful. And I use, I, I use them as uh, literary references mm -hmm. in the titling of my work to clearly allude to the fact that this work is, as I said, mm -hmm. part of a larger history of black expressive culture. I'm not just making this up. I'm not just doing this. I'm in conversation with mm -hmm. this history, trying to find my place in that history, mm -hmm. but anchored and inspired by that history Mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. You know, I had the, the pleasure of, of, of knowing Roy DiCaravo as an undergraduate uh, at Hunter. And, um, you know, he would, I mean, the idea of giving yourself over to the process. John Coltrane, giving yourself over to the process. And, you know, as, you know, he would put a, a, a negative in the fix, and then you would see it emerge from the white page, yeah. right? Yeah. When you think of John Coltrane, you know, something like In a Sentimental Mood or Naima, you know, it's emerging. That softness is emerging from the sound of, of his saxophone. Many different ranges in that saxophone he could use. He could be, you know, he could give a sermon in that saxophone, high notes, and just fly up there. But when he got deep into the song or when he got deep into that, that tenderness, the Langston Hughes tenderness, it could really make you emote. It could really make you cry. It can really make you feel more human. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and as you know, although he never, to my knowledge, performed professionally, mm -hmm. Zikawaba himself was a saxophone player. So his relationship to train was both musical as well as uh, this visual and personal, because he knew all those musicians that he was photographing. Mm -hmm. I'm frequenting those clubs and having conversations with them. Yeah. And uh, even though it's not what I make photographs of, if you are in Chicago, or New York, or San Francisco, you can find me in one of the jazz <laughs> right. in one of the clubs. I'll be at the Correct. venue, I'll be at Smoke, I'll be at the jazz. Uh -huh. Like, those are my thinking ones. Vanguard. So I'm still very mm -hmm. deeply connected to uh, the musical impulse that I came out of. Yeah, it, and it's important to be connected to those things that make you feel more human, that make you, you know, connect to this deeper sense of what it means to be here and now. You know, and when I think of, you know, Night Comes uh, uh, Tenderly, I really think, you know, how do you actually bring a, a sort of softness 
an awareness, but a certain temperature to that, that picture. There are these pictures that are about you know, these very grave things, these very desperate moments in which people are going through these landscapes, you know, not, not tenderly, but they're trying to escape bondage. They're trying to escape the law, right? These are people who are stealing their own bodies because the law is literally against them because they are property, right? And so what does it mean to actually go to these places yourself, physically go to these places, these sites, and then really try to you know, bring this reality out, but not in a harsh way, but you do it in a way that, that really connotes to the idea of the musicality that, that you're talking about, this, this, this softness, this uh, poetics. I mean, how do you balance these two things? Well, it's interesting, I mean, there's, uh, I'm trying to figure out the most condensed way to describe it. I, I think the first thing, uh, every artist makes work to bring to life the thing that they believe is there. It's here, and you have to make it visible. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in these places where I make my work, especially with Night Coming Tenderly Black, uh, those photographs, much like Viggo Robert's photographs, they were not made in actual circumstances mm -hmm. that are as dark as they appear. Mm -hmm. You know, all of the Kawaii's photographs, if he had made those beautiful, dark, black, rich photographs mm -hmm. of black subjects, Mm -hmm. and understood how to manipulate the photographic material to make those subjects almost come out of this thin two-dimensional paper. Mm -hmm. It has dimensionality. But there's not, you know, it's all about the mastery of and the use of an understanding of the photographic uh, craft and material. So for me, you know, beginning with Night Coming Tenderly Black, which was the first group of photographs that I made in this trilogy, uh, I go there with an idea. The idea was about black fugitivity through that landscape, mm -hmm. under cover of relative or different kinds of darkness. In order to shield those fugitives, formerly enslaved, Mm -hmm. who are now moving through that landscape in an act of self-emancipation, which, had they been found, could have meant ultimately their death, or at the least a return to those situations of enslavement. So that's what I'm thinking, and that's what I'm seeing when I'm there. Mm -hmm. When I'm there, I'm seeing both what's there, but I'm also seeing the finished thing that I'm there to make. Yeah. So I could, I could say that uh, it's a process. Yeah. It's a process of making the photographs and then having that raw material on the negative and then manipulating that material mm -hmm. to make the thing that I am yeah. there to make. And what, what's interesting about it is the making, the making piece, is very distinct from the emotional piece. Hmm. You know, which I thought about listening to the panel just now, folks talking about the trauma. And I've always had people ask me, how can you even go there? Hmm. I, I, it's too traumatic for me. I can't go there. Hmm. How do you go there? What do you feel when you're there? Hmm. And I always tell people, the trauma all of the narrative of that takes place before I'm there. It's kind of why I'm there. Mm -hmm. But being there is a making problem, yeah. which is a completely different issue. To be able to see clearly, to see the imagined thing as you look at the thing that is there, and to figure out how to make the imaginary mm -hmm. become real through the manipulation mm -hmm. of the optics and material. Yeah. of this particular media. And as I always said, the, the emotions are not very helpful or useful in figuring that out. Mm -hmm. it, it's a strictly a making thing, how to make something at a certain level. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't negate the other thing, mm -hmm. but they each have their place. And for me as a maker, as an artist, I need to go there and be clear about what I'm seeing, 
how to shape the space, especially with a space as seemingly limited as the trail. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the other places, I roamed around in different locations in northeastern Ohio, five different plantations in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. But now, I'm in the enclosed space of this trail that runs alongside the James River. And I need to be able to really see the, for lack of a better word, the structure of that landscape, mm -hmm. yeah. the architecture of the landscape, to be able to see the form, because form is what I work for. Form is my language of getting at the other things mm -hmm. that make people have that response yeah. that they have. But it's how I manipulate the form and the materials to make this thing, and then certainly scale. Scale is uh, another important piece of it. The transfer, you know, to transform the work from being a small object-based kind of experience yeah. is something large enough to actually physically engulf the viewer and to pretty much shut out the rest of the world at the periphery mm -hmm. uh, of our vision. But it's all about a making challenge and being as clear as I need to be in imagining what I'm there to do not just to see it and record that, mm -hmm. but to see that as something else and to make that, if that makes sense. Makes sense. I, I don't know, y'all just heard something about mastery, <laughs> right? <laughs> that, that this is mastery you're, you're hearing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everything, mm -hmm. what, what does it mean to be in a condition, right? What does it mean to be in a space? What does it mean to be in a space that most people feel is a traumatic space, a, a space of a deep, experiential history, enslavement, a space of escape, right? People leaving enslavement. What are, so the bounds of enslavement, what does it mean to be born in a territory or in a, a plot of land that will encompass your entire life because you're owned by somebody, right? Then what does it mean to leave that space or steal yourself away from that person and that space into a place that you don't know? Into a world in which you never sl slept a night in the woods, right? but you're following a path out of hope, right? And what does it mean for a photographer to engage this history and as a craftsman, as a craftsperson, we have writers here, we have other photographers here, we have people who understand what craft means. What does it mean to, as a craftsman to actually understand the condition but not be pulled in by the trauma of the condition to say that I'm here to make something that translates to other people in a two-dimensional form, right? That black, means black, flat. black and white, two-dimensional. How unlike the world itself? Right, right, really, right. right. It, so you walk around the gallery and you see these flat objects, but he's pulled you in because of his mastery of light, composition, all of the elements that make a photograph really uh, particularly compelling. But then there's the history he's also engaging you. This is the master storyteller. Yeah. And it's, and it's context, and it's also. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of the history based work that I have been doing since the Birmingham Project in 2012, they're all also very intentionally made in black and white. Mm -hmm. So they are divested of the color of the present moment that surrounds us. Mm -hmm. And also because black and white is a material of photography's history. Mm -hmm. So immediately the effect of looking at a black and white photograph, especially in a particular context, kind of transports you away from the contemporary moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it looks very unlike, because if you look at that black and white photograph, and then you look away, there's somebody walking around in a yellow sweater and purple pants. I mean, the, the world is just bursting with color. But that's not, that's not what this is. Mm -hmm. This is something else. Yeah. So that intentional use of uh, photographic, photographic material, black and white material, and was one of the first decisions that I made uh, in uh, this history-based work. I, I was working in large-scale color. Mm -hmm. just before the Birmingham work. And to make a large-scale color photographic object, it's a very contemporary way of, of envisioning the world and using the material 
especially with a large or medium format camera and their written material description mm -hmm. and deep depth. Of, you know, there are languages. And the photographic medium has gone through evolution historically in how the photographic language is deployed materially mm -hmm. and in terms of scale. And I kind of live inside of that history as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm living inside of the history of the medium that I'm in conversation with. And I'm also in conversation with the history of what matters to me. Mm -hmm. And with this more recent work, I'm in conversation with the history of the landscape in mm -hmm. photography. Yeah. And yeah. photography, in which the black presence has not figured very heavily. Uh, a lot of black art production centers on the black body, mm -hmm. not the unseen black body, but, but that the very pl present black body. People don't understand how difficult it is to move from the human figure, right, to landscape. It was very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was like learning to speak another language. Well, it was. I wouldn't say like learning to speak another language. It was mm -hmm. learning to speak a different language. Because up to that point, the language that I understand is that beautiful highlight on mm -hmm. Juan's forehead, mm -hmm. the way he's clasping his hand in a very <laughs> idiosyncratic way. You know, I, I, I understand all this. You uh -huh. know, black just, you know, just the way behavior uh -huh. and form. I understand all of that. Mm -hmm. But I've always been aware, even with the portrait-based work that I've made over the last 40-some years, that the place and space that those subjects inhabit is also very much a part of the narrative of the work. Mm -hmm. But it's not just you. If you're sitting on stage at the VMFA, mm -hmm. that's a very different place from you sitting on a chair in your kitchen. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's a very different narrative. Mm -hmm. So I've always been acutely aware of how the narrative of place shapes the meaning of, you know, and I've, al and I've always organized the pictures around that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like now you take that out and you're trying to photograph the historical residue yeah. of unseen presence. Yeah. Which, first because you to believe that that residue is still there, which I do. Mm -hmm. Everything, I read something years ago uh, that said, every place is both the place that it is and the place that it was. And that's kind of my operative sense yeah. of how to think about place. It is what it is, but it's always also the place that it was. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that, for me, it's about structuring work that makes that resonate. Part of the resonance, of course, is context. Mm -hmm. Context is hugely important. Yeah. You know, it kind of clues you in that you're going to a particular place, which, depending on who you are, begins to set up your response. You know, like, uh, so walking on the, uh, the trail of the enslaved, right? What's so compelling to me is that how hard those pictures were. And so if everyone in the audience were to look to your left or your right, you're going to see elbows, you're going to see overlapping of, of all of the, the people in front of you to your side. Now, when you look at those, those pictures, you see branches jump out, catch light. You see, so he's looking at a landscape that's condensed with angles, that's condensed with all of this visual information, and you have to fit that into what, a rectangle? Yeah, you have to figure out the four sides of that. And it's always mm -hmm. all picture making uh, on the two-dimensional surface is, is always about, you know, fundamentally two things. The mm -hmm. edges, like what's the beginning and the end, where does this thing start mm -hmm. and stop? And then how do you use or optically manipulate the foreground, mm -hmm. the middle ground, and the background? Mm -hmm. That's the imagined space of the two-dimensional object. Right, you right. know, the foreground, the middle ground, even though it's none of that, but optically, yeah. you're trying to create. In order for the work to come viscally alive for the viewer, there has to be some sense of, mm -hmm. you know, an acute awareness of the space, yeah. the foreground, and then the optical manipulation of that space that makes things in the foreground 
kind of push out into your space almost. Right. Like I better duck my head. Look like that branch is about to smack me in the face because right. it's right there. But that's an optical manipulation of the raw material right. that I have to work with. And, and this is why he can't be overwhelmed by the, the trauma of the scene. This is why he can't be overwhelmed by, he could be in it, but not of it, right, at the same time. And, but all of the things that he's describing brings us into the work that makes us cry, right? That makes us feel things. And so on the one hand, you have the technical side. It's not on the one hand. Together, you have the technical side. And then you have the history of why you're there, right? Then you have the sort of ancestral, right? A place that was here but is here at the same time. Can you speak about like the idea of the ancestral, about, uh, that, that sort of presence uh, that compels you to make the work as well? Well, if you, well, if you read the introduction to the exhibition when you walked in, and if you uh, have a copy of uh, the Elegy book, when you open the first page, it says quite clearly that this work is for the ancestors. Mm -hmm. that, that's why I do this work. I'm trying to keep our ancestors present in a contemporary uh, conversation. Uh, because that's who we are. And in the absence of our continued uh, recognition of them, we become unmoored from who we are. So for me, as an artist, I'm very clear about the need to be very forward-reaching in the practice of my craft, mm -hmm. how I deploy the craft, the material, the medium, of the work, but I'm also acutely aware that what motivates this work is to bring our ancestors, to bring the ancestors back into this present conversation mm -hmm. in a place like this, mm -hmm. or in the places where my work is shown, in the galleries, in the museum. Yeah. You might go to a museum in a gallery for um, uh, any number of reasons, but when you encounter my work in those spaces, it's probably going to move you to think about mm -hmm. things that might not be necessarily, unless you came for that show mm -hmm. of my work, to consider the things that I value. Yeah. And, and the reason for putting those things in an exhibition context is to make them matter to whatever viewer is yeah. standing in front of them. It's interesting we mentioned the history of landscape photography, right? Or even history of landscape in Western art. You know, African Americans have been subjects and, you know, we're running away. But, you know, we, we, our humanity has never been placed within a scale. You know, so we think about, you know, the great historical paintings. You think about, you know, what, what, what constitutes uh, uh, landscape photography or painting. African Americans are not seen in space that way. It's usually the, the, the glory of nature, but not necessarily, you know, how man interacted or conquered that nature. Right? So, or it could be about that as well, but when you think about African Americans, you think about the ways in which we are absent from that mm -hmm. to actually make work that doesn't have a black body in it, but it could be so black at the same time. Right? That, and that's my, con that's my conversation with that landscape tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, a tradition that uh, with a few significant contemporary disruption uh, has been largely based on, I would say, two things. An Amazonian impulse, mm -hmm. for one, to get man to commune with nature. And then uh, secondarily, you know, the grandeur of the unpopulated, unpopulated mm -hmm. landscape. Yeah. And that notion of the uh, 19th century Western survey photographs mm -hmm. of the unpopulated landscape, which in fact were very well populated by indigenous Native Americans who were already here. Mm -hmm. The way those kinds of landscapes became the visual corollaries for, to the blueprint of manifest destiny. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's wide open, it's beautiful, we need to inhabit it. Yeah. We need to take it and transform it. Beautiful. See the photographs, there's no one in them. Yeah. You know, so into uh, that history, and there have been, you know, there, there are photographers 
you know, Emma Gowan, and there's a whole bunch of uh, American photographers who have disrupted that particular uh, landscape tradition. But uh, on the whole, black artists, uh, other than someone, and it might be why I've been attracted to his work, which is based on landscape, but it's not explicitly landscape, mm -hmm. somebody like Richard Mayhew, yeah. who works in that tradition. But it's still not the black subject, even as black artists have made work about the landscape. So I'm having my own subversive, uh, transformative conversation mm -hmm. with this tradition. Yeah. Like I'm using part of that tradition to talk about something radically different. And it's a radical psychological means. I mean, when you think about, you know, the Middle Passage, you think about, you know, people coming from, you know, Senegambia, you know, you think about the, uh, you know, different, you know, the different groups of, they come from homes, they come from families, they come from lineages. They, you know, they, they come from, you know, the Sunufo, the, you know, the, the Igbo, the Yoruba, but they come from societies that are thousands of years old and they have families, they have names, they have deep roots from where they come from. And then they're stolen, or then they're stolen and then they're taken, you know, on the, to the slave forts and then, you know, on the water, on the Atlantic for weeks and months across the Atlantic, and then, you know, the, the Gambia River feeds into the Atlantic, and then the Atlantic feeds into the Mississippi, right? And then the Mississippi, you know, they, they go, you know, and then, then they're sold and on auction blocks. And then from, you know, the ship, you capture the trail. And so the disorientation you see, you know, in the video, it's about what does it mean to be here? Because they come from somewhere where they already have names. They already have families, and so, how you may feel looking at it is because you have a family. You have people you come from. You have a long history that you can understand, but imagine being on the same track. Imagine being stolen from them, and then you're on a path that you don't know. And so the disorientation at eye level, right, the video, at eye level, the disorientation, the sounds, the possibly the smells and the colors, that's what you're supposed to feel because you are them to some degree if you understand what it means to be taken from where you're from. Yeah, and none of us, none of us will ever know what history looked like, what history sounded like, mm -hmm. what the actual sound of uh, enslavement was. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly with the uh, film work, the two-channel film work here, uh, 350,000, I wanted to begin to try to reimagine the sound of history, mm -hmm. the layered sound of history, from the moment of enslavement, walking on the trail, mm -hmm. and then the history of African American expressive culture mm -hmm. that comes out of movement and the black body and the slap in the body, and the hand bone. There's a whole mm -hmm. expressive culture that comes out of, you know, extends from this movement of black bodies. Yeah. You know, and trying to, I guess, sonically layer 400 years. Mm -hmm. You know, like the sonic landscape, the soundtrack of 350,000, it's meant to suggest the compressed, layered sound of history, both going from that moment and going forward. Mm -hmm. If we could take that and give it a sound, at least from my subjective mm -hmm. you know, uh, point of creation, what might that sound like? What might it feel like sonically and then visually to be walking in this unknown landscape after that journey of thousands of miles and now you're in this place that you've never, what does that look like? What's that might, what might have that have felt like? You're looking, you see the water, yeah. you know, you're looking, the sky's still here, you know, with no sense of where any of this leads, mm -hmm. but it's been horrific from the beginning, so couldn't be anything but more horror that lies ahead as we're trying to navigate this unknown space. You know, with 350,000, I wanted to put the visual imaginary and the sonic imaginary into conversation with each other. 
to try to visualize what history and black bodies in space might have sounded like over those hundreds of years that we've been here. Mm -hmm. So you hear all kinds of things in that soundtrack. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's all based on the sound of the feet, which we started by recording uh, in the Foley pit uh, here, here uh, in Richmond. And then just overdubbing, using overdubbing uh, as a way of equating with the overlapping and overlayering. A momentum. Uh, yeah, momentum, history. Yeah. Find, trying to find a rhythm in that, mm -hmm. you know, because there is a rhythm that has emerged out of that. So trying to find a sonic equivalent mm -hmm. for that, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we can move on for days and hours and whatever, but I just want to thank Daoud for this conversation. I want to thank everyone for coming to this conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you.